and welcome to our 2023 speaker series presented by the New Jersey chapter of the Fulbright Association. Today's speaker is Dr. Jorge Haina, who will be introduced by Holger Henke, a member of our New Jersey board. We are pleased to announce that today's presentation is co-sponsored by the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, University of the West Indies, Kingston, Jamaica. I'm Pat Hutchinson, president of the New Jersey chapter. This speaker series was established in 2022 to encourage New Jersey uh, Fulbright Association members to introduce themselves and share some of their many experiences and interests with fellow Fulbrighters. We also host invited speakers on timely topics as we have done for today's webinar, Ukraine, China, and the Second Cold War, active non-alignment in our time. The Fulbright Association is comprised of current and former recipients of Fulbright Awards and supporters of international education. The association represents over 400,000 alumni worldwide. New Jersey has over 300 active Fulbright alumni and friends, as well as thousands of people who live in New Jersey and have traveled abroad on Fulbrights. Additionally, New Jersey has hosted a great many foreign visitors who have come to live and study here. Exchanges benefit our state economically and educationally. In 2021, nearly 20,000 foreign students came to study at New Jersey's colleges and universities. Their economic contributions came to over $617 million to our state. In 2021, roughly 60 New Jerseyans received Fulbright funding for foreign study and teaching. Fulbrighters represent virtually every field of interest and come from every, or sorry, come from over 165 countries. What ties us together is a commitment to advancing mutual understanding, tolerance, and peaceful relations worldwide. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jorge Heine and uh, Professor Holger Henke. Thank you, Pat. Good afternoon. I'm Holger Henke, Director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Warm greetings from Jamaica, I'm certainly. It is my very great pleasure to introduce this afternoon our speaker, Ambassador Dr. Jorge Heine, who is currently affiliated with Boston University. More specifically, Dr. Heine serves as the interim director of Boston University's Frederick S. Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. You notice that I said ambassador, and this points us to the fact that Dr. Heine is a practitioner of international diplomacy and foreign policy, but he's also a scholar. On both fronts, he has many successes to show, more than I'm able to mention here in great detail. But suffice it to say that as a practitioner, Jorge has served as ambassador of Chile to South Africa in the mid to late 1990s, to India in the early 2000s, and to China from 2014 to 17, and also as a cabinet minister in the Chilean uh, government. He has taught at Wilfrid Laurier University, at St. Anthony's College at Oxford University, at the University of Constance, and at the University of Paris. Dr. Heine holds an MA and a PhD from Stanford University, and has been prolific as an author of no less than 17 books and some 100 journal articles and book chapters. He serves or has served on editorial boards of prestigious journals such as World Affairs. He also served on the board of the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies. Although he was also the president of the Chilean Political Science Association, I know Jorge as the former president of the Caribbean Studies Association, an office I also had the honor of holding some 12 years ago. Jorge and I were both working in China between 2014 and 17, not together, separately, uh, but unfortunately we couldn't find an opportunity to meet while we were there. Big country, tight schedules. I'm all the more ecstatic, therefore, that he has agreed to join us today 
to talk about some of the topics in his latest book, Latin American Foreign Policies in the New World Order, the Active Non-Alignment Option. Let me close by mentioning that more information about Jorge's work can be found in his website at www.jorgeheineck.com. To our viewers, uh, welcome also again. If you have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat and we try to get through as many as possible afterwards. Jorge, welcome. It is good to have you with us today. Tell us, if you would, about how your new book was conceived and the thrust of its main arguments. Good afternoon, Olga. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Let me thank you and your interest and Pat's interest in making this happen. We have been working on this for quite some time, but you have been unwavering in your commitment to it. Uh, one positive outcome of this uh, delay is that the event in relation to the Fulbright Association of New Jersey is also being sponsored by the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Research at the University of West Indies in Mona, an institution very close to my heart. As Dr. Helga mentioned, we both met originally at the Caribbean Studies Association of which we were both presidents. I started my career, my academic career actually in Caribbean Studies in Puerto Rico, many years ago, more than I care uh, to remember. And I feel particularly privileged uh, to have uh, this uh, launch today being co-sponsored by the ISCR in Mona. Uh, a week ago, we had another launch in San Augustine uh, at the IIR uh, at the University of West Indies in, in, in Trinidad. So I feel like I'm coming home and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, at a time when the world is especially troubled, it's important, it seems to me, to think of new ways we can uh, move forward and cope with the very shifting and complex international uh, scenario. And uh, that is what our uh, book uh, is all about. Uh, the book is came out in February of this year. This is the English edition of the book. It was published by Anthem Press in uh, London. And it's had a, a pretty good run. It has generated tremendous interest. We have had launches so far in New Delhi, uh, in, um, in Pretoria at the a, uh, at a round table. I participated in um, 10 days ago, um, as I said earlier, in, uh, in San Augustine and in, in now in uh, Jamaica and in New Jersey, of course. Uh, so what is this about and what are we uh, trying to uh, convey? In this, uh, in this book. Um, what it is basically is a guide for Latin America uh, in particular, but a lot of my colleagues have argued also for the Global South more generally, how to navigate these very difficult waters that we are, faced, that we are facing right now. So uh, I will get into the substance of our proposal in a minute, but first, let me start with a puzzle. Um, I like to tell my students that uh, in political science, uh, the key thing to do before starting any uh, research project, before starting any paper, any thesis, is to be as thorough and as systematic as you can in defining the problem. That is in asking the right question. If you ask the right question, much else will follow. If it is the wrong question, uh, well, you know, you will be in trouble and you can do very thorough work, but uh, the result will not necessarily be very uh, encouraging. So what is the puzzle that uh, we have been contending with in the, in the past year? And that puzzle has to do with the war in Ukraine a major turning point in international relations, as many observers have pointed out. Uh, this is, you know, the bloodiest conflict in Europe since World War II. Uh, we all see on our television screens at night, uh, the tremendous suffering that is being inflicted on the Ukrainian people. Uh, this is a major violation of international law, of the United Nations Charter, uh, of the principles of sovereignty and of non-intervention. And as such, it has been condemned 
very actively and very straightforwardly by uh, you know countries in North America, Europe, um, elsewhere. And uh, this leads me to the question, uh, given all this, and given that you know in Latin America, there is a very strong tradition of international law, respect for international law, interest in international law, of respect for multilateralism, um, a region of the world where uh, the principle of non-intervention is particularly cherished, you would think that Latin American countries uh, would be you know, on the forefront of siding with NATO, of siding with the G7 um, in, well, on the war in Ukraine. Uh, yet that has not been the case. Um, some of the major Latin American countries, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, um, have taken a much more, some would say ambivalent, others would say ambiguous, others will use other words to describe the attitude of these governments. There are some interesting differences also between the way the ministries of foreign affairs in some cases handle the issue and the way their presidents have handled it. Um, fascinatingly, the one thing in which there's been some continuity in the foreign policy of Brazil, uh, the only issue in which there's been some continuity in the foreign policy of Brazil between President Bolsonaro and President Lula has been on the uh, unwillingness to take a, you know, a strong stance with the West uh, on the issue of, of the war in Ukraine. Uh, Brazil has not uh, done that in, in both cases. Uh, so, um, you know, no country in Latin America has voted against the UN resolutions condemning uh, the invasion of Ukraine, yet four abstained. Venezuela was not present in the original March 2 vote, March 2, 2022. Um, in the vote to suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council, nine Latin American countries abstained and three voted against the resolution. And uh, the only Latin American country that has supported the political and economic sanctions imposed by the G7 on Russia has been Costa Rica. No other country has done that. So the question becomes, why is that? Why this counterintuitive behavior on something that, according to some observers, should be you know, a slam dunk, um, as it were, given Latin America's traditions and the very obvious uh, violation of international law that has is taking place and took place in uh, Ukraine after the Russian invasion. So having posed uh, the puzzle, uh, and I'll come back to answer it uh, further down the, this talk. Um, let me uh, hark back to what uh, Dr. Henke uh, asked me when he introduced me and uh, speak about a bit about the origins of this notion uh, of active non-alignment and the origins of our book that is just out in its English edition. So uh, the notion of active uh, alignment originated first in 2019 and was developed further in 2020 in an article we published my, with my colleagues, the, our uh, the co-editors of the book, uh, Carlos Fortin and Carlos Ominami, um, in 2020 in the journal Foreign Affairs Latino America, which is the Latin America edition of the Foreign Affairs Journal published in, in New York. This is a journal published in, in Mexico. And in July of the year, we uh, published that uh, piece. Um, and uh, it was framed, not obviously uh, by the uh, war in Ukraine, which had not happened at that point. This was you know, three years before that, two years before that. But it was framed in the context of uh, US-China struggle for primacy in which Latin America was caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, active in alignment was a bit of a manifesto calling for countries in the region not to give in to pressures uh, from either Washington or Beijing, uh, stick to their own interests and not let themselves be pushed into taking sides. Uh, 
it argued for much greater uh, political cooperation and regional integration in the region at a time when the region was extremely fragmented. Let us remember 2020, of course, was the year of the pandemic. Uh, Latin America, as you may or may not know, was the region most severely affected by the pandemic. With 8% of the world's population, Latin America had 30% of the world's deaths from the pandemic. Uh, 2020 was the year, according to ECLAC, of the region's worst economic performance in 120 years. GDP in Latin America fell by 6.6% at the time when world, world GDP fell by 3.3%. Uh, this year, projections are that, according to some projections, Latin America will again have negative growth. So, you know, it is not coming out of this uh, very severe crisis uh, very well at all. And so uh, what we were trying to do was to point out that we needed a way forward, that we needed a way out of this very serious situation in which we found ourselves. And to give you an idea of the fragmentation that existed in the region, you may recall that in 2019, as soon as he was, as soon as he took office in Brazil, President Bolsonaro, one of the first measures he undertook was for Brazil to leave CELAC. CELAC is the leading umbrella regional organization in Latin America and Brazil, the biggest country, left it. So that, it seems to me, gives you a pretty good um, indication of how fragmented and how uh, divided uh, the region was. Um, there was very little uh, cooperation uh, on the pandemic. Um, it was basically every country for itself. Uh, no plans of, say, working, you might have thought, there might have been some effort, you know, to buy uh, masks and on some sort of joint platform to buy protective equipment or later on the vaccines. It was, you know, basically every country uh, for itself, uh, which obviously contributed even more to the uh, crisis. Uh, Brazil has the dubious distinction of being the second country after the United States with the highest number of deaths, official deaths from the pandemic, somewhere around 700,000. You know, which in itself uh, tells you something. Peru is the country with the other dubious distinction of having the highest number of deaths uh, per capita in uh, in the in the pandemic. So it's a pretty uh, you know depressing picture. And what we're trying to say is that uh, Latin America needed a different approach. And here, quite apart from the um, economic crisis and the health crisis that we uh, lived uh, through. It is also important to keep in mind the degree of uh, international uh, isolation and international, um, you know, basically uh, irrelevance into which uh, Latin America has been uh, drifting. Um, today, no, there's not a single UN agency that is headed by Latin America, not one. This is since Michelle Bachelet left uh, the, her position as head of the United Nations Human Rights uh, Commission. Uh, listen to this, the World Economic Forum used to have a Latin America chapter. It was closed, lack of interest. <laughs> um, the um, GRULAC, that is the group of Latin American heads of mission at the United Nations in, uh, in New York, has become, it's been basically sidelined. It doesn't participate in any of the most significant uh, debates. Um, interaction with other regions, this is you know, a very telling indicator. How eager are the big powers to interact with Latin America? The answer is they are not. Um, Summit of the Americas was supposed to be held in the United States in April of 2021. In many ways, it would be an ideal moment shortly after the um, election of President Biden. 
It was kicked down the road for 14 months, did not take place until June of the next year. Um, the ministerial forum that takes place, you know, the, between um, China and Latin America, is supposed to be held every three years, was supposed to be held in January of 2021, was not held until December of 2021, kicked down the road again. And uh, our European friends uh, have not had a summit meeting of heads of state with Latin America since 2015. We're talking eight years now. So what does that tell us? It tell us, tells us of a region that has moved from the periphery to you know, utter marginality. You know, it doesn't count in, uh, in international affairs anymore. And that, it seemed to us, uh, was a recipe for disaster. It would only make things uh, worse at a time when the international system is undergoing significant changes. Well, those that do not participate in the building of the new architecture, well, will be left with whatever's left, some room in the basement perhaps, uh, while those that do participate in it will obviously have much better quarters and much better uh, facilities. So uh, it wasn't just the overall drift of the region, but also uh, the timing that was particularly uh, worrisome and uh, irksome. Now, it is in this context that we have to look at the uh, pressures in which uh, Latin America found itself from uh, the uh, great powers in this new, um, in what we call the second Cold War. And here, there's a very interesting argument. You know, we set forth the argument in July of 2020 that we were uh, facing uh, a second Cold War, uh, this time with China uh, playing the role that uh, the Soviet Union played in, uh, in the you know, first Cold War. And um, in that context, you know, we received quite a bit of criticism and a number of colleagues uh, pointed out uh, and said that this was wrong, that the tensions that we saw, that the differences that we saw between the United States and China were a trade war, yes. Remember, you know, the um, measures that were taken by the Trump administration, the tariffs that were set up uh, against, uh, you know, the income of Chinese goods. Uh, and it was also obviously a tech war, uh, you know, remember Huawei and uh, the differences on 5G that was so significant. But that it was not an ideological conflict like the first Cold War was. And that it did not have a military dimension. That it was, you know, more of a trade issue. And that our um, defining it as a second Cold War was quite uh, alarmist, if not downright uh, wrongheaded. Well, three years later, uh, the difference between, you know, the West and uh, the rest is being defined by some as the difference between democracy and autocracy. What can be more ideological than that? You know, I would argue that very few things could be so. And moreover, uh, well, we now have a, a war, which is not a cold war, it's a hot war in, in Ukraine, I've already mentioned. But we also have expressions of strong uh, military tensions between um, the United States and China. And we saw them on the occasion of the visit by Speaker Pelosi to uh, Taiwan in August of last year, which led to significant Chinese military exercises over the island, uh, creating uh, considerable international tensions. So I would argue that uh, the argument that we are, in fact, very much um, in a second Cold War has been confirmed by developments in the course of the past uh, three years. Um, 
some observers have referred to as us being in the foothills of a new Cold War. Uh, I say we are climbing the hills uh, pretty, uh, pretty fast. And you know, recent developments um, like uh, what we saw with the um, globe over the United States, the Chinese globe flying over the United States that increased tensions quite considerably and led to the cancellation of the visit of Secretary Blinken to, uh, to China and uh, of a planned visit by Secretary of the Treasury Yellen to China uh, underscore that issue. You know, and here, a key point is obviously not so much whether the United States and, and China are uh, willing to engage in some sort of armed conflict. Uh, I'm sure you know, none of them is. But what can happen is that there may be an accident. Uh, you know, it can be the South China Sea. It can be some other reconnaissance uh, you know, vehicle that may lead to it. And that is the uh, danger that we are uh, facing. OK, so. In this um, in this context, then Latin American countries have been um, facing some very um, you know serious challenges, and there have been specific uh, projects. Uh, there was one one that I uh, was particularly involved in, and when I was ambassador in Beijing, and that was uh, to build and install a fiber optic internet. Uh, Trans-Pacific submarine cable from Valparaíso to Shanghai. Uh, this was an MOU that was signed. It um, led to a pre-feasibility study. Uh, then there was a change of government in, in Chile. Uh, I left the embassy. And by 2019, there were very strong pressures from the United States to cancel that project, which it was. Um, there have been a number of projects in Panama um, which have also been uh, canceled uh, due to the same reason. So this is not an abstract question. Uh, this is something that translates into the um, canceling of specific major infrastructure projects on the ground. Uh, it is in this context then that we um, draw on the uh, autonomy school of Latin American international relations theory, the works of writers such as Elio Jaguaribe from Brazil, Juan Carlos Puig from Argentina, um, to point out the need for, for Latin America to exercise its uh, autonomy and not let itself be pressured into siding with one or another of the uh, great powers. But here, I would like to underscore a significant difference, uh, you know, between the situation of what was the Northern Line movement in the uh, 60s and 70s, you know, when we spoke about the third world. And today we speak about the global south rather than the third world. And, uh, and what is the difference between sort of then and now? The difference is that today, of course, we have seen the rise of emerging economies of rising powers like China, like India, like Indonesia, like uh, Brazil at its moment, like Turkey, uh, countries that are really making a mark in the uh, international system and that uh, make for a very different uh, picture in you know, the global south, what I call the new south. So the, the basic uh, argument here is that this um, active non-alignment that we are uh, suggesting, that we are proposing, um, takes place in an environment in which the South, the developing countries of the world, find themselves uh, in a much stronger position than they did in the uh, 60s and 70s. And let me give you an example. Um, in the 60s and 70s, uh, the big uh, flag, the big demand of um, developing countries in the NAM was, as you may recall, the new international economic order, the demand to transfer massive amounts of resources from the north uh, to the south uh, to compensate for the exploitation that had taken place during colonialism and uh, imperialism. Um, that demand did not have, uh, did not resonate very much 
um, you know, there was the Brandt report that looked at it somewhat sympathetically. At the beginning of the current administration, there were some there were some rumblings about that this might be something to be considered, but by and large, it didn't lead uh, anywhere. You know, this was what you know has been called the diplomatie de carrière de doléance. That is diplomacy as victimhood. We are victims, and reparations are uh, due. Well, today we find ourselves in a very different environment. You know, um, a key statistic I like to cite to my students is that there are more billionaires in Beijing than there are in New York City. Uh, Beijing, of course, is also the um, site of the headquarters of the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank. Uh, and in Shanghai, we have, as um, Dr. Henke knows very well, the New Development Bank, the so-called BRICS Bank. So what we have is, you know, this is wonderful term that has been coined by my uh, colleague, Leslie Armijo, collective financial statecraft. And that is the ability of countries in the developing world to rely on their own uh, financial entities that will be able to provide resources to undertake uh, the projects that they want to undertake. So they do not depend just on knocking doors in Washington, Paris, or London. Uh, they also can access resources uh, within uh, the global south within the developing world itself. So that is a very different context from the one that existed, you know, 40, uh, 50 years ago. Very well. Now, uh, moving from sort of the structure that uh, lies beneath the current uh, international system to what we might refer to as the agency of, of countries as they deploy their uh, foreign policy. It is important to underscore the difference between uh, active uh, non-alignment and terms like uh, neutrality and even equidistance. Uh, active non-alignment is not about being neutral. Neutral is a legal term that has implications for the behavior of states uh, when war is being waged and you know what type of commerce, what type of trade can be undertaken, whether arms can be delivered or not, and so on and so forth. And you know, Switzerland, as we all know, is coping with that right now. Um, active non-alignment and non-alignment more generally is not about that. Uh, countries are obviously free to take their positions on various issues. But what it means is that you don't align yourself automatically with one or other of the great powers. You evaluate your foreign policy choices, uh, each of them on an individual basis and make an informed choice uh, according to what uh, the particular issue uh, entails. This of course is much more difficult. It demands uh, more stringent analytical capabilities than just acting according to what you're told. It's much easier to act according to what you're told. Uh, it is more, challenging to evaluate each issue individually and then uh, move forward uh, accordingly. Um, there is a notion of, of equidistance uh, that um, has been set forth and, and we have a chapter by leading Argentine uh, political scientist Juan Gabriel Tocatlian in the, uh, in the book. Um, and uh, obviously a difference of interpretation, but again, uh, active non-alignment is not about keeping an equal distance from the great powers. Um, on some issues, for example, it is perfectly possible that, say, on um, democracy and human rights, you might have in Latin America and elsewhere in the Global South a position closer to that of the United States. Uh, on other issues, say, on international trade, it is perfectly possible to have a position that is closer to China. So, you know, equidistance is not, again, some sort of, uh, you know, mathematical uh, approach um, that will put you squarely at, you know, sort of the same distance from both. This will vary uh, from issue uh, to issue. Now, uh, what I found particularly uh, fascinating, you know, the, the, again, to go back to sort of the, the history of the book, uh, what happened was we published this article in, in, in July of 2020, it generated considerable interest so much so that we had 
a webinar in, in Santiago in, in August of, of 2020 with six former foreign ministers of Latin American uh, countries, some of the leading countries in Latin America, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, uh, Peru, Chile, Argentina. And uh, this led to the idea of putting together an edited volume, uh, you know, which we did. And we that was published in Spanish in Chile in November of 2021. Um, and the book was launched in five countries. We launched in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Peru, and Canada, and Mexico also had an event on it. And um, what was very interesting is the debate that it uh, generated. We have published several follow-up articles on it in Argentina, in Spain. Um, the debate and the reviews that uh, came out, you know, um, around the world, and uh, what some of the reviewers pointed out is that more than a future-oriented proposal, active non-alignment is something that is being applied in practice. That is that Latin American countries are already uh, evaluating each issue on its merits and refusing to side automatically either with Washington or with uh, Beijing. And that is of course what happened with the case of Huawei uh, you know, the Chinese telecom giant that is uh, the cutting edge producer of 5G technology. Uh, you know, many Latin American countries uh, were submitted to strong pressures not to adopt that technology, although it is the most cost effective and the most advanced. Um, now, you must realize what this entails. In some cases, it meant if you would have done that to take out uh, cables that were already in place and substitute them for you know, others that were more expensive and, you know, uh, less efficient. Now, obviously that was not a very sound business proposition. And in fact, it didn't get anywhere, you know, and most countries proceeded to allow Huawei to participate in the 5G uh, bids uh, that were held in various countries. Brazil originally said, and the Bolsonaro originally said, okay, we will ban it. And then they backtracked and said, well, we will allow it, which they did. Um, and there was one particular instance uh, which reflected this, you know, uh, sort of a a being applied in practice. Um, and that was the, the summit of democracies. We, we just, the second summit of democracies was just held, of course, but the first summit of democracies was held in DC in December of uh, 2021. And a week earlier, uh, the China Latin America Ministerial Forum was held in uh, virtually in Mexico City. Um, and most Latin American governments participated in both. And they saw no conflict in doing so. They didn't think that they had to choose between participating in the Summit of Democracies in Washington and in this ministerial forum at foreign ministers level with uh, China in Mexico City. And they, you know, engaged in in both. Um, and uh, in Foreign Affairs, Brian Winter, who refer, reviewed the book, referred to it as the region's most significant foreign policy development since the end of the Cold War. Um, and uh, in its year in balance of the year 2022, Foreign Policy Magazine, another leading uh, magazine in Foreign Affairs, called it, called 2022 in Latin America, the year of non-alignment. So again, more than a manifesto, um, this was considered a finding of sorts, sort of establishing what is actually happening in, in the region. Now, uh, to go back to uh, the in initial puzzle that I uh, posed to you at the beginning of this uh, talk, what I would like to convey to you is that this apparently, you know, puzzling reaction in Latin America to uh, the war in Ukraine is not because of, you know, happenstance, is not because Latin American leaders feel at a loss as to what to do. No, it is because they are, a, well, uh, basically acting without calling it that way, but they are basically applying, you know, active uh, non-alignment. Uh, they are realizing that uh, this is a European war uh, that there's no reason why they should get involved. 
Um, I mean, we had the recent visit by a German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, who, Olaf Scholz, who visited uh, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina. And the main reason for his visit, you know, in Chile, 10 years had gone by uh, from the previous visit of the German Chancellor. And the main reason for this visit was to ask Latin American countries to provide weapons to Ukraine. Now, you know, Latin American countries have been reluctant to endorse and in fact refuse to endorse economic and diplomatic sanctions. Now, countries that refuse to endorse diplomatic and economic sanctions are being asked to provide weapons. I mean, I thought it was really a stretch. And you know, this was asked both by Germany and by the United States, and it was unanimously rejected. Uh, providing weapons would make these countries into belligerents in the war. In the war's outcome is still uncertain. And you know, there was little reason why this should actually happen. And in fact, it didn't. Um, now, as I said earlier, I've been in the past month, I've been in, in India and I've been in South Africa um, discussing this topic. And I've seen firsthand that um, this uh, notion of uh, active alignment is limited to Latin America. It is also very much present in Asia and in uh, Africa. So active alignment arose in the context of the US-China spat and the conflict with Russia has its own features, but shares others, including the dynamic of sort of the West versus the rest. India plays a key role in it, having discovered its non-aligned roots despite closer ties in, recent, in the recent past with the United States. 17 African countries abstained in the United Nations General Assembly vote to condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The role of the BRICS that in many ways embodies the new South that has emerged in the new century is uh, critical. Now, as often happens, uh, it is the German language that has provided us with the perfect word to define uh, this period, and uh, Chancellor Scholz has called it eine Zeitenwende. The German language has this great advantage over most other languages that you can actually paste words together and use them in a variety of ways. So we get uh, Weltanschauung and Fingerspitzengefühl, and we now get uh, Zeitenwende, which means a change of epoch. Um, and it seems to me that what we have seen in the course of the past year in, in this um, you know, uh, tripolar um, Cold War that we are uh, witnessing, far from weakening uh, the argument for active neural alignment, it uh, strengthens it. Uh, active neural alignment provides a useful compass, a guide uh, to action in a turbulent world, opening the possibility of finding a common posture in Latin America, one that would also strengthen the relations with the rest of the world. Uh, there would, of course, be no agreement on signing up either with Washington or Beijing or Moscow. And ANA remains the most attractive option in this uh, setting. Uh, in, that, uh, in that context, what we have seen in the past year, year and a half in Latin America with the election of a number of progressive leaders who are committed to regional cooperation and to regional integration in a way that their predecessors uh, were not, open some interesting uh, possibilities, it seems to me. And uh, the role that we are seeing President Lula uh, play in putting forward a peace proposal for Ukraine. Uh, President Lula uh, visited Washington, discussed this uh, with President Biden, although he disagreed on it. Um, he has also spoken, President Lula has spoken with President Zelensky on the phone, the Ukrainian president on it. And Celso Amorim, who was Lula's foreign minister in his first two terms, in office and is now his um, foreign affairs advisor in Plan Alto and Celso Marim has the closing chapter in our book on Brazil and the Global South. Uh, Mr. Amorim will be traveling to, it has been announced, will be traveling to Moscow to explore further uh, the possibility of the Brazilian uh, peace mediation effort. And, uh, you know, it seems to us that uh, Brazil's uh, initiative shows 
um, you know, active uh, non-alignment at its best. Uh, Brazil is not taking a, a stance of siding with uh, the G7, with uh, NATO. It has kept its option open. It has, um, you know, acted in a non-aligned fashion. But at the same time, um, it has not become a passive actor. It is said uh, that Brazil wants to contribute to uh, bringing peace to um, Ukraine and has come up with um, a proposal uh, that uh, will be uh, discussed in, in days and weeks um, to come. Um, let me finally close with some reflections on uh, the Caribbean. Uh, in the book, uh, Jorge Castañeda, former foreign minister of Mexico and one of Latin America's leading intellectuals, he teaches at uh, New York University and has written many significant uh, books and is a well-known commentator. He makes the case that um, active in alignment is an interesting notion, but that we should keep in mind that it uh, is most relevant to South America rather than to the countries in and around the Caribbean basin. The argument being that the countries in the Caribbean and Central America and Mexico itself are much more dependent on and much more integrated to the uh, North American and particularly the US economy. And that makes it for them much more difficult to take a, an all aligned stance for reasons of not just economic uh, you know, reasons, but also social, cultural, and so on and so forth, migration flows, all sorts of remittances, all sorts of things. And uh, that is, you know, an argument that has obviously some merit, but, you know, reflecting upon it, um, I found it interesting. And I thought that's why I wanted to close on this note, um, that if we look back at the 70s and 80s, um, a number of Caribbean countries played a key role in the non-aligned movement. You know, and Holger is in uh, Jamaica, and ISER is one of the co-sponsors of this event. Well, Michael Manley was a very significant leader in the Nolaline movement. Um, Maurice Bishop in Grenada. Um, you know, um, Guyanese diplomats played uh, a very uh, significant role in the Nolaline movement. So, you know, there's a history there that seems somewhat to counter uh, this, uh, in many ways, quite logical argument that Jorge Castaneda makes. I was also struck by something that I found very interesting. Uh, in the recent um, summit of the Americas, uh, there was a strong pushback towards the notion that some countries would be excluded from participating in the summit, that they were not being invited. And, you know, Originally, CARICOM voted not to participate in the Summit of the Americas for that reason. In the end, you know, they didn't happen. But a number of Caribbean and a number of Central American countries didn't go to uh, the Summit of the Americas uh, for this reason, although most South American leaders did. So I would like to leave you with that thought uh, as to what role the Caribbean could play in a policy of active Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jorge. That was a far-reaching, wide-ranging conversation that you led us into. Uh, you know, China, Taiwan, United States, Latin America, um, Ukraine, Europe. Um, we are all over the map, really, in, in, in the relevance of what you're putting forward then, in terms of your talk. <clears throat> um, I'm inviting all the uh, our listeners and participants to put forward any questions you may have into the chat area for Jorge to answer. And while you may be thinking about what to ask, um, there's so many options, I know. Uh, maybe I take the privilege of the chair to um, ask a question, but actually I wanted to invite you um, first, um, Jorge, to just talk a little bit more. You talked in the, in the context of Huawei. Um, 
uh, talk about a bit uh, about the socioeconomic impact that China's foreign direct investment in the global south has or can have. Of course, they have the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, by which they are uh, going around in Asia a lot, um, but really going beyond going to Africa, Latin America, uh, other places. What does it mean in practical terms, uh, the kind of uh, development projects that China offers, the kind of foreign investments that it proposes to engage with um, partners in the global south? Sure. Well, um, let me say this. Um, the um, basic point here to keep in mind is that what China has uh, put on the table in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this is uh, something that 21 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean have signed on to. Um, and um, it is basically about infrastructure and connectivity. The idea is to build up uh, you know, highways, railways, ports, uh, bridges, tunnels, which is what um, China has done in, in China, and uh, it is basically you know, covered with cement, as you might have seen, Helga, most of the plant in China. And now construction, Chinese construction companies need to go elsewhere uh, to do something similar. And they are saying they can do that in the uh, global south, and uh, they can do that in Africa, they can do it in Asia, they can do it in, 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 in Latin America. And um, that is something that points to a, a real uh, need as you may recall, the World Bank in, uh, in the uh, 60s and 70s was into infrastructure building, but something happened and they basically gave up on it and moved to soft issues like uh, you know, health, education, uh, poverty alleviation, and uh, left uh, infrastructure building behind. As a result, there's an enormous deficit in infrastructure in many countries in the global south, and uh, China has uh, stepped in to uh, attempt to remedy that. Obviously, this doesn't happen one day to the next, but in the 10 years that we have seen uh, the DRI in action, it has done, uh, it has done quite a bit. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I'm still waiting for any um, panelists to step forward, uh, uh, for any um, uh, uh, participants to step forward, have any questions for Jorge. I think this is a fascinating conversation, fascinating talk. Uh, you mentioned, of course, M Michael Manley and, and um, Bishop in Grenada and others in the Caribbean, in Guyana, um, Cuba, who led in the 1970s the, uh, uh, the call for a new international order, uh, not were part of the non aligned movement back then. Now, nowadays, we have, of course, in Barbados, a very strong voice in the uh, with the current Prime Minister Mia Motley there, uh, making very strong um, uh, arguments in international forums uh, for uh, an AMA stance to be taken, uh, certainly by her country and by extension other Caribbean countries. Um, Jorge, I, I'm quite aware that as ever so often the United States are aggressively and insensitively, I should add, pursuing if not even trying to impose a particular agenda vis-a-vis -vis, um, China and Russia. But I'm also wondering whether the uh, um, uh, active non-alignment uh, premise, namely that the United States and Europe are forming one formidable alliance in this pursuit and uh, the, the resulting simulacrum of equidistance, you made the case there's no equidistance really, uh, uh, from these perceived blocks, from all perceived blocks, really, if, if, if that doesn't tend to gloss over a little bit, that there are very significant disagreements between and even within European countries, and for that matter, within Taiwan, too, and that several countries are far from supporting the United States. So the current stance, for example, uh, the, the European Union is taking regarding the war in Ukraine is far more driven by Eastern European countries mm -hmm. who have, of course, vivid memories of uh, Soviet rule uh, than by some of the previously significant players such as France and Germany, mm -hmm. uh, where there's much more nuance and significant resistance um, to simply isolating China or trying to completely defeat Russia on the Ukrainian battlefield. 
Uh, I'm pretty sure actually with uh, Easter coming up soon, you will have the traditional Easter marches uh, making that point very visibly in the media in, in several European countries. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, if the, the premise of the uh, active non life movement does not throw, does not pay sufficient attention to the, you know, the fine um, uh, differences that are actually existing within what we may call a block. I think those are very good points. And obviously the differences between the position taken by countries like uh, Lithuania or Latvia and those taken by say Germany or France are, are quite significant. Now, that said, it seems to me it's important to keep in mind that uh, the situation in which uh, NATO found itself uh, under President Trump, uh, you know, uh, subjected to strong tensions uh, and uh, the situation under President Biden in which NATO is much more unified than it was, you know, um, three or four years ago. So in that sense, I would argue that the war in Ukraine has uh, contributed very strongly to the growing unity of, of NATO, uh, despite the differences that you quite rightly mentioned. Now, again, to go back to the argument that has been made, that uh, the war in Ukraine would uh, underline, that the main cleavage in the world would be between democracy and autocracy. Um, I would argue that that is not the case at all. Why? Because some of the largest democracies in the world, like India, like Indonesia, like Pakistan, like South Africa, like Brazil, like Mexico, uh, are not uh, endorsing the position of NATO, are not uh, siding with uh, the G7. They've taken a different position. So I would argue that what uh, the war in Ukraine has really shown is that the biggest cleavage in the world is not so much in democracy and autocracy, but between a North and South, between the global North and the global South. And that, it seems to me, is something we, that we have to, uh, to keep in mind. Thank you. I just got a message from somebody saying that chat is disabled for her. I encourage the person to uh, put her question into the Q&A area instead. I hope that will work. Um, I don't know how Christine left us, so I'm not sure how we're addressing that issue. Um, I, I don't know if we can have anybody actually speak um, in the... Can, can we activate their um, audio? All right, maybe if we try once... Uh, as we're trying to figure that out, um, I think this was Judy Nygaard who wanted to pose a question. Judy, um, if you're still there, um, I'm encouraging you to use the question and answer um, field in our chat, in our meeting. Um, so Jorge, um, I think Shakespeare proclaimed that comparisons are odious. So mm -hmm. We're always doing them, uh, and probably for some reason. Uh, so, so nevertheless, uh, with a view to the current war in Ukraine, a war with very tangible consequences also, I would say, for the global south, I am wondering how wrong or how accurate it is to compare to another major historical crisis in the center of Europe that arguably also had globally felt consequences. Uh, I'm referring to the Sudeten crisis of 1938, when Hitler, um, immediately following the annexation of Austria, also claimed parts of Czechoslovakia as belonging to Germany because of the German language speaking populations prevalent in these parts of that country. Yes. Um, of course, Chamberlain and Daladier's um, agreement on that claim would forever be considered by historians as a negative example of appeasement. How do we compare that to Ukraine? And why mm -hmm. is an active non-alignment stance on it not reminiscent to appeasement? Yes, uh, uh, this is a question that is often posed. And one of the most frequent parallels that is made is between, you know, the, today, and uh, what happened in the late uh, in the late 30s, uh, with the implications being that, well, you know, today Ukraine, tomorrow, you know, perhaps the rest of Europe. Um, 
I am not quite sure that the parallel holds. Um, you know, the situation of Ukraine, a former, you know, Soviet province, uh, is, I would argue, quite, uh, quite different. But let me just quote on this uh, Indian Foreign Minister Jay Shankar, uh, whom, you know, I met in my recent visit to India and uh, who uh, released my book there. He has a phrase, it seems to me, that uh, reflects uh, very well uh, the problem that we are facing. He has said that the time has long passed in which Europe could consider that Europe's problems were the world's problems, but that the world's problems were not Europe's. Um, the way it is seen by many countries in uh, the Global South is that this is a European war that should be solved by Europeans. The notion that this should become a global war in which all 200 countries around the world should somehow pitch in and supporting Ukraine to defeat Russia is not something that is universally shared. It is a tragic war, but so are many other wars around the world. The war in Yemen has cost 250,000 deaths so far. Nobody has called to exclude Saudi Arabia from the SWIFT system or to have a global embargo against uh, Saudi Arabia. There's a reason for that. And that is because that is happening uh, in the South rather than in the North. So it seems to me, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar's reflection is something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. I know there's of course, of course the question of oil as well, right? Well, I'm very sorry that I'm not, that we may not be able to hear questions. I'm again asking participants either to try the chat or if that's not possible for some reason, I don't know why the question and answer se um, section in our conversation. Um, Jorge, I'm not quite running out of questions yet, uh, <laughs> but um, would, you, would you care to tell us a bit more about your home country, Chile? How is it positioning itself um, with regard to uh, active non-alignment and the issues that were raised in, in your talk? Sure. Uh well, it, it goes to show that in uh, Latin America uh, uh, today, uh, there is a, a variety of views on this. As I mentioned to you, uh, some of the leading countries in um, Latin America, like Argentina, like uh, Brazil, like uh, Colombia, like uh, Mexico, uh, have taken a, a studiously uh, neutral stance uh, on, on the war. In the case of Chile, President Boric, has taken a somewhat uh, different uh, stance. He has spoken with President uh, Zelensky and has been much more sympathetic to uh, NATO's position and to, to the G7. So, you know, there are variations uh, in the case of, of Latin America. As I said earlier, Costa Rica, for example, has also um, endorsed the application of diplomatic and economic sanctions on, on Russia. So this is, you know, by no means a uniform uh, region-wide uh, position, but it is the position that is emerging among some of the leading countries in the region. Okay, thank you. Pat, I think you would have a, at least a voice if not, uh, if you weren't able to type in anything. Well, I have to say that I, I am very interested in, in what you were saying about the comparison to, you know, the, the the drama that we all feel about the comparisons uh, of the Russians to the Germans in, you know, in a, a former day. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, your um, observations on those are really, you know, really enlightening to me, particularly in that uh, tomorrow I will be greeting the uh, Ukrainian family that we're sponsoring coming over. I think there will be some good conversations there. There is, of course, also con considerable, um, as, as it may be muted, uh, criticism in Russia. Uh, many are voting by, with their feet, um, going to Western Europe to uh, seek asylum there. A lot of young men um, 
have been leaving Russia through southern borders, uh, maybe through Turkey, some of these places. Uh, so, so there too, you have uh, a muted criticism going on there in Russia. Okay, um, I, at this point, I don't have any follow up questions um, to you. And I'm still not seeing anybody uh, in the chat. Um, so I'd say this is the last opportunity I'm making available for everybody. Um, but I certainly want to thank you so much for your thank you. this afternoon. Um, continue the good work. Um, we certainly understand in the global south that um, to, to extend the range of options uh, for development in particular is, a, is the order of the day. Um, uh, life here is much less about thinking about the future than the daily survival. Um, and is dominated by those necessities of environment, uh, kind of environmental catastrophes. We were looking at the new hurricane season coming soon. Uh, it's something that's affecting more and more the uh, North American continent as well. Um, so there should be areas um, uh, also for common interests that we should explore more in the future. Um, but uh, generally speaking, development is uh, and things are not looking too rosy, even though the economy per se may show signs of rebounding out of the COVID crisis, uh, talking here about Jamaica. Um, but, you know, it does not necessarily translate into the everyday lives of, of many uh, people. And that's really where, uh, for many countries in the global south, the uh, priorities lie. And so, therefore, if you can find ways to extend, um, can extend, uh, uh, you know, options for development and options for international cooperation, and that certainly is an important um, uh, area for the south to uh, to to continue pushing for. I think. So, thank you for your. Very good. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a good evening. Thank you. There's a message I'm seeing now. Oh, it's from Pat. Thank you. Also saying from Pat Hutchinson. Um, on behalf of the uh, uh, New Jersey chapter, uh, uh, New Jersey Fulbright Association chapter, and the Sir Arthur Lewis um, Institute for Social Economic Studies at the University of West Indies. Thank you so much. And I uh, thank all the participants uh, for attending this afternoon. We will put, we will have recorded and with your permission, Jorge, um, sure, we, of course. That we, thank you. We put um, this uh, video um, on our Facebook website in the coming uh, uh, couple of weeks, maybe. Right? Terrific. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Your book cover. Hmm? I would okay. like to see Jorge's book. You have it? Yes. Okay. Bring it up. Very okay. good. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Very Thank you. All right. Good. There we are. Very good. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Pat. Thank you, Holger. Thank you, Christine. Bye bye.